everybody. And on this very, very cold night, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you all to this, uh, this event this evening. Um, Northern Ireland from Peace Talks to Brexit Talks, hosted by Trinity Research in Social Sciences. Looking at the, the guest list, I, I know that we have quite a few attendees this evening who've traveled a very long way to be with us, so thank you very much to them. We also have a number of very distinguished guests, including Sarah Tiffin, who's Deputy Head of Mission at the British Embassy here in Dublin. So Sarah, you're, you're very welcome. My name is Eleanor Denny. I'm Director of Trinity Research in Social Sciences, also known as TRIS. And TRIS is the hub for all social science research here at Trinity. It represents over 200 academics working in the social sciences across 14 disciplines to address the major challenges of our time. It's a great pleasure to be hosting this very timely and stimulating event this evening. And we have a really stellar lineup of speakers. Um, I'd like to, to just give you a teaser of, of the, the voices that you're going to hear throughout the evening. So up first we have our chair, Dervil MacDonald. Dervil is Group Business Editor of Independent News and Media. She's a Global Eisenhower Fellow and winner of countless awards and accolades, including the Mary Cummins Award for Women of Outstanding Achievement in Media. She's a proud graduate of the Trinity Law School. And uh, Dervil is going to kick off proceedings this evening by setting the scene and remembering Bloody Sunday. And following Dervil's introduction, uh, we will have Professor Paul Arthur, for, who is Professor of Politics at the University of Ulster. He's a pioneering academic in the area of international conflict resolution. He's author of five books, the latest being Special Re Relationships, Britain, Ireland and the Northern Ireland Problem. He is chair of the Northern Ireland 50th Anniversary Civil Rights Commemoration Committee. And Paul will discuss the civil rights movement and its underlying principles of inclusion ref and reflection within the wider context of Brexit and the EU. Then we have uh, Professor Atain Tannen, who is Associate Professor in International Peace Studies here at Trinity and an expert in Northern Ireland and British-Irish relations, in conflict resolution and in United Nations and European Union politics. She is currently writing a book on British-Irish relations in the 21st century to be published by Oxford University Press. And Atain is going to explore the legacy of John Hume and the lessons learned from Brexit. And Finally, we'll have Dahi O'Kialik. Dahi is a former Irish diplomat and a former Secretary General of the Department of Foreign Affairs here in Ireland. He's also a former ambassador to Finland, Estonia, the UN, and from 2001 to 2007, he was ambassador to the United Kingdom. He has served as Director General of the Institute of International and European Affairs, and in 2017 was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Ulster for his outstanding contributions to the Press Council of Ireland and the peace process. And Dahi will talk on the impact of Brexit on Northern Ireland. So um, I'd like to sincerely thank our distinguished lineup of speakers, Derville, Paul, Attain, and Dahi. You've all given up your time very generously today to contribute to what I know is going to be a really stimulating and enjoyable evening. We've got a packed house, and I know many of our, our audience are going to want to ask questions and delve into some of the issues that you're going to raise, but I would ask the audience to hold your questions until the the question and answer session. Uh, we'll have a panel session at the end. And for those of you who are on Twitter, we encourage you to tweet away during our, uh, our evening and the hashtag for tonight's talk is Talk Northern Ireland. So without further ado, I will hand over to our chair for the evening, Durval. Thank you very, very much. Nice. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it's uh, really, really great to be here. It's a real honour for me to come back um, to my alma mater, uh, to Trinity, to to really to have a very, very special um, and very, very timely discussion um, to mark or commemorate the 50th anniversary of uh, the Civil Rights Movement. I can't physically bring you back to the Civil Rights Movement because it had, uh, it had commenced uh, long before I was born in 1977, but I, like every single one of you here, um, am a product of it. We're part of that living legacy because the reality is that Bloody Sunday changed the course of history for us all. It shaped our collective history, and it certainly, I think, shaped my personal history. When I look back now, after 
15, 16 years in journalism and look at the reasons that led me first into law here at Trinity and later into journalism, I've no doubt that it was my background growing up in Northern Ireland during the conflict that led me here, growing up with a, an innate sense of um, the injustices that were there in our society and wanting to confront it, um, wanting to be a voice for um, people who had none, as many didn't. And I think it also brought home to me growing up in Northern Ireland the importance of the rule of law and our democratic institutions. And those were some of the factors that led me on to the path um, that I took. Um, I was in second year here in Trinity um, and just looking out at some of the faces of probably the same age as many uh, as you are now and I was in second year in Trinity when the Good Friday Agreement um, was signed and um, my little sister who's here with me tonight was only eight at that time and what I recall from that period here at Trinity was a sense of urgency, everybody trying to get everybody up home or to wherever it was they were cast, a little bit like the, the marriage equality and referendums of, of our time, trying to get people home uh, to vote. I remember when it did pass, just such mixed emotions of elation, of excitement, disbelief maybe in some quarters, the gratitude, the relief, the relief. I remember crying at the result. And then also just the sense of the challenges um, that lay ahead. Um, and when I look back, actually, what were some of the biggest things for me in the Good Friday Agreement? I grew up on the border um, uh, near Clog Army Base, one of the biggest British Army bases in Northern Ireland at that time. Uh, the stretch of road between my mummy's home and Dundalk, my dad's in Newry, where we lived, was known as Bomb Alley, such were the amount of atrocities that happened in that. And I have a very, very vivid recall of those structures. And it wasn't just the demilitarisation, it wasn't just the walls that came down at that time, it was the the sense that the walls were coming down in our hearts uh, and our minds, really just all of those structures. And one of the big bams of the Good Friday Agreement, one of its crowning achievements, even though it's under a lot of pressure, was that it really, really gave us a chance to express our identities without having to go into kind of these sides. So I grew up a Catholic, you probably know the name like Derval, uh, broadly in the nationalist uh, tradition, um, and probably for the first part of my life identified just with that Irish side, such was the way we were brought up. And now when I look back, I can acknowledge the very British part of my identity and history. Uh, what, all the football teams you followed, all the TV things that you watched, the fact that it's uh, Her Majesty's um, stamp on my birth certificate. And I can now say, and I've written a piece in The Guardian uh, shortly to be published, I can now say that I'm Irish-British, something that I might have been tarred and feathered for um, in another time. So um, it's extraordinary for me to be here tonight to facilitate uh, this debate. I tried very, very hard, certainly, in the early part of my writing career to stay as far away from Northern Ireland as possible. I didn't want to be defined by the conflict. I didn't want to be defined by where we grew up. But um, Mr. Brexit had other plans. <laughs> and now it is, as the, the business editor of the largest news group in the country, it is front and centre of what we do every single day in all of its forms. Um, I wonder how different tonight's conversation would have been had David Cameron not started us down the path that he was. I actually do think that Brexit would have happened in one sense or another. I think that internal uh, division within the Tory party would have um, alerted itself at some time. But I wonder how different it would it be. And I wonder now when we look tonight, looking back uh, 50 years, learning the lessons from those, setting it in context, um, how different a conversation we are now. But if you're a student of uh, history, you're very lucky you're living in the middle of it. <laughs> Um, without further ado, I'm going to invite you to, you've heard some of the introductions, Paul Arthur is going to bring us back to the birthplace of the civil right movement, or movements, as he may suggest, and place it in a broader context. And he's going to ask the fundamental question, was the conflict the product of a fundamental misunderstanding about the organising principles of modern politics? A team, Tannen, that we're, we never knew each other until Brexit. <laughs> we're sick of each other now. Our paths are crossing uh, very, very much. I think it's going to speak to us about the legacy of John Hume um, and that great phrase that he um, coined, looking to a united Ireland as opposed uh, to united Ireland and looking what lessons we can learn. And then finally, Dahi O'Callaghan, who has way, way too many accomplishments, but who who has critically served as a former ambassador to the UK is going to perhaps look back at some of the key turning points um, in the UK-Ireland relationship and indeed beyond with Europe and maybe see how we can frame it now. So without further ado, uh, please join us. It is hashtag Talk Northern Ireland and um, this is a bit where I get to channel my inner Davina McCall. It's being recorded so do not swear and uh, sit back and enjoy. Please do uh, participate in the conversation both in the room and outside of it and we look forward to engaging with you afterwards at a huge panel discussion but first and foremost Paul, welcome you. Uh, 
Uh, good evening. Um, unfortunately, unlike Darville, I was a physical presence in 1968 and was involved in all those early protests. Uh, I went to Queens in 1963 and graduated in 67 and took a year out and went in what was then fashionable, went and worked in the kibbutz in Israel. And while I'd been at Queen's, I'd been involved in radical politics, always in the left, uh, largely not to do with Northern Ireland, but to do with the Vietnam War, protesting against the Vietnam War. And uh, when I left Northern Ireland in 1967, for that year, I didn't realise what I was going to come back into, because there was a huge degree of fatalism. There was a belief that things would never change here, and suddenly they changed very, very rapidly. And now, 50 years on, I've been chairing the 50th anniversary civil rights commemoration movement, where for the past 15 months we've been reflecting. We've had something like 43 public meetings, and from the beginning we said that we had to be both inclusive and reflective. Uh, that we were trying to uh, learn from the decade of commemorations with the notion of ethical remembering, that we had to be self-critical. It was not to be an old comrades association of clapping ourselves in the back and saying, wasn't that a great job we did? Because as I've reflected on this past 15 uh, uh, months, we realised that very many mistakes we made, and I may reflect on some of those. But this time, on this night, 50 years ago, there was a mini riot in the Guildhall in Derry. Because the Derry Housing Association, an organisation that had been formed by John Hume, among others, had put in a bid for two blocks of, uh, of houses to go up in various parts of Derry. And it was turned down by the London Derry Corporation at the time on the usual sectarian 12 unionists in that occasion it was seven nationalists. And as a result of that, the Dairy Housing Action Committee, which was separate from the Dairy Housing Association, blocked the place, closed it and refused to let anyone out, and that led to pandemonium. That was 50 years ago. We do those sorts of things now. Now what's, what struck me when I read that today, because I'd forgotten all about it, was that how much our politics have changed. And what I want to try and do, because of my age, is try and put into context how the civil rights movement emerged. It did not emerge in 1968. The roots were there from much earlier. The roots actually go back to the Education Act of 1947. Because we were the first generation from the Catholic community who were able to take advantage of third level education. And the classic example of that, of course, was John Hume himself. John Hume was born in 1937, 1947, 1948, 11 years of age, when it was the first opportunity for someone from his background to go to St. Columns College in Derry. It, it, not, it just wasn't expected, and then on to university. So that was one thing that set the scene. I think other things, and we have to look at this globally, a couple of other things are very, very important. One was, I think, what I call the Johannine Papacy, the Papacy of John the Twenty-Third with the notion of resorgimental, with the notion that, in fact, Roman Catholicism was not necessarily monolithic, that it could question itself. And out of that, particularly for Ulster Protestants, a realisation that Roman Catholicism may not be the threat that they thought it was, and therefore the beginning of self-questioning in that community. As well as that, you have the election of John F. Kennedy as president in 1960. And in many a Catholic wall in the bog side and throughout the north, there was the triptych of the Sacred Heart in the middle, John the 23rd on one side, and John F. Kennedy on the other. Which, you know, is, when you think of it, it's really weird. Um, <laughs> give, um, well, well, let's not go into that. Um, but the fact that Kennedy had been elected was another instance of huge self-confidence beginning to emanate in that Catholic community, that we were beginning to move away from fatalism and beginning to believe, as that first generation of graduates were beginning to uh, realise there could be a new form of politics. It was also the end of 13 years of what we called a Tory misrule with the election of a Labour government. And with people inside that Labour uh, party and government who decided that something needed to be done about Ireland, 
Now, they didn't do too much, but at least they'd moved away from the notion that you let sleeping dogs lie and that uh, Northern Ireland had to be changed at some stage. And uh, you had, as early as 1962, for example, you had a 14-day march from Liverpool to London, I think organised by the Connolly Association, about conditions in Ireland. In 1964, you had the creation of the Homeless Citizens League in Dungannon. Now, the important point about the Homeless Citizens League was it was formed by three working-class women who decided that given the condition of home, homelessness, they weren't prepared to put up with it any longer. And then, of course, in 64, you had the campaign for social justice in Northern Ireland. In 1967, you had the formation of the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association. Before we get into August and then October of 1968. The reason I mention this is because I, have, I believe and I believe more firmly there never was a civil rights movement in Northern Ireland. There were civil rights movements, and that, in fact, was one of its weaknesses. We did not speak with any particular coherence. Uh, we were a melange of generational, gender, class, and ideological struggle. And in the first couple of years after the famous 5th of October march, and I was on that, after that, you begin to see the civil rights movement disintegrate into the various factions. And I want to comment on that. Also, very conscious when we formed our uh, commemoration committee that it was the 70th anniversary of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. That in fact, when we speak of rights, we're speaking about social, political, civil, and human rights. And much of that got lost in what is euphemistically being call, called the troubles. So again, we need to reflect on that. And when I look at outside influences and what, and what really had a big influence on the civil rights movements in Northern Ireland, I take it geographically from two ends. One is the American dimension and the other is the European dimension. And a great deal will be spoken of the European dimension tonight. On the American dimension, I've already mentioned the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War had a huge influence on my generation on the left, as it had, of course, in the United States. Along with that, of course, you had the civil rights movement in the United States. And it's difficult to know to what extent we were influenced by Martin Luther King. I like to think that we were very deeply influenced by it. I'd always seen myself as being a pacifist. I never believed in armed struggle or anything like that. And if you look at some of the early demonstrations in Northern Ireland, for example, the Homeless Citizens League, they've got young boys dressed up, black faces, describing themselves as being from Alabama. So even as early as 1964, that message was getting through. And it came home to us very strongly with the Montgomery Selma March, or sorry, the Selma Montgomery March, which again I'll come back to. But uh, Martin Luther King, I think, uh, really, I, uh, really gave us two abiding influences. One was where he speaks of the inescapable network of mutuality. The inescapable network of mutuality. And that is something which we did not take up as much as we should have. And again, I see that as one of our biggest mistakes. And the second was a huge influence of his letter from Birmingham Jail, which is subtitled, Why We Can't Wait. Because he kept being told, just wait for another while. And he, who came from a passive tradition, said, no, we can't wait. But if we're going to get ourselves involved in civil resistance, it has to be non-violent. And there were those who also believed that that would be no problem for us, our generation. But I remember attending a lecture given by Conor Cruz O'Brien in the Whittler Hall in uh, Queens in October, November 1968, when he warned us, those of us who had formed the People's Democracy, that while we thought we were non-sectarian and anti-sectarian, what existed in Northern Ireland was what he called frozen violence. And once that violence begins to thaw, it will lead to conflagration. We were a generation full of our own self-righteousness and our own idealism. We didn't see any reason why we couldn't press ahead. 
and so we did press ahead. So there was that influence from the United States, and I like to think, and I'll, again I will come back to Martin Luther King, that that was a strong influence. Others may not agree with that. Um, the second is Europe, and of course 68 was the year of May Days. One of the events that we participated in this year was a meeting with the French uh, students at the Sorbonne on this May to reflect on 50 years. But it wasn't just France. Throughout Europe and indeed in Latin and Central America and the United States and in Asia, in places like Japan and Korea and elsewhere, there was this huge student revolt. And this is the generational. And much of that revolt was based on the notion of spontaneity. It was against the old left. And it was summed up by Daniel Cohen Bendit in, in Paris when he, when he came out with the phrase, and you have to excuse my execrable French, Bourgeon d'abord. Let's push things on. We'll think about the theory afterwards. But spontaneity leading to a mass movement, leading to just continuous action, would get rid of the, of the system. And the classic example for us in that was undertaking what became known as the Berntollet March in 1st of January 1969. Now, the background that is very interesting. I was, one of, as I say, one of the founder members of the People's Democracy. I was also a member of the Young Socialist Alliance. And when, when, when the civil rights movement began, there was a huge outpouring among the student generation. Up to 3,000 students found no difficulty in going from Queens to the city centre in Belfast to pro protest against what they saw as unionist misrule. But as the spontaneous marches went on, those numbers began to diminish. And it was the militants who were in control. And when we decided, or when we put it to the student body, that we should have this march from Belfast to Derry, it would go on the basis of the uh, uh, Selma Montgomery march of Martin Luther King. Now, if you go back to that Selma Montgomery march, there were, in fact, two marches. On the first, when they got as far as Edmund Pettus Bridge, they were brutally beaten off it. They went back, regathered, reassembled, and two weeks later, they went on the second march. And that second march got through. And when they did reach uh, Montgomery, Martin Luther King gave one of his most brilliant speeches. I think that why it succeeded was because in his letter to, uh, uh, from Birmingham jail, he said that if you're going to engage in this sort of activity, four things are essential. There are four components. The first thing he says is the collection of the data. If you believe that there is discrimination, you must objectively prove that there is discrimination. So you need to collect the data. And that is precisely what the campaign for social justice had been trying to do. The second he says is negotiation with the authorities. On the assumptions that the authority is not going to concede. And that leads to the third, and the third is crucial. He called it self-purification. Because you do, you do not get involved in the fourth non-violent civil resistance unless you're ready for non-violence. And I think that was one of the big distinctions between what we were at and what he was at. And I think that when we went on that burn toilet march, we pushed it through after the end of term. Most students had gone through and we in the Young Socialist Alliance said, we're going in this march. And that march, I think, had a profound impact now, uh, on, on what was to follow. Now, I firmly believe that the system would have broken down in any case. I firmly believe that because the fracture inside the unionist, loyalist, Protestant community was so deep, it was going to happen. And that if the Prime Minister did concede, as Terence O'Neill wanted to concede, he was going to be harassed from his right wing. But no matter, there, there was... A, one of the uh, commentaries on that march, if I can find it, was um, from a literary magazine called Threshold, I think it was published by the Lyric Theatre in Belfast, uh, by someone called Owen Sweeney, who I think was from Dublin, who had come up to the march, and he had this to say, the violence that had grown around us was a living proof of the rottenness that was built into the system. 
The violence that had grown around us was a living proof of the rottenness that was built into the system. Our little march had lit a fire that would help to burn out the dross of Ulster. Words are wonderful and words are cheap. Our little march had helped to lit a fire, had lit a fire that would help to burn out the dross of Ulster. You don't think of the consequences of your actions. And one of the consequences of that action was our slide from some form of non-violence towards outright violence and towards the euphemism, the troubles. So, and I believe that at that stage, and particularly in February of 1969, when Terence O'Neill uh, called his, what was known as the O'Neill election, uh, that that was the end of the civil rights movement as any sort of coherent force. Because in that election, three people were elected from that civil rights tradition. John Hume, um, uh, Ivan Cooper, Paddy O'Hanlon, and of course Austin Curry had been elected for the Nationalist Party. And they were the generation that were going to push things forward, but trying to do it at the political level. So that became very, very important. I want to refer, because I'm, you know, uh, my trouble is I would talk all night, so I, I want to refer very, very briefly uh, to the European dimension. Um, and that comes out with Bloody Sunday. I have no intention of saying anything about Bloody Sunday. But on the 1st of February 1972, a French foreign policy statement uh, put together at the Quai d'Orsay recognised this is when the United Kingdom and Ireland were attempting to enter the European community and it was at the very last stages of development and the French Foreign Service was saying we have to be very careful here. We have to be extremely careful. There, there, there are two countries who want to join us and we are, they are at the brink of a civil war. In 1973, a Brussels um, think tank called Pro Mundi Vita produced a pamphlet in which they described that what was going on in Northern Ireland was equivalent to the wars, the religious wars of the 17th century. Because we have to remember that at that stage, Europe was at peace with itself. This is before the Balkans and everything else. And Europe saw itself as a model of conflict resolution from the European coal and steel community onwards. And Europe did not want this messy little civil war among it. But one of the outcomes, I believe very, very firmly, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, one of the outcomes, I believe, of that joint accession in 1973 was that British-Irish relations were now not driven by an excess of intimacy but by a much more global approach where Ireland no longer had to raise its sore thumb and talk about partition. They had to be engaged in functional cooperation with the United Kingdom and others. And I believe that Europe has been a huge boon to what has happened in Ireland in the years since. And this is what worries me about Brexit. Thank you. There were three things that just jumped out at me just from Paul's um, three phrases about you know, that inescapable, inescapable mutuality, which is something that is still with us. Conor Cruz O'Brien's frozen violence, that, co that, that causes me fear in this context now to the extent to which any of that frozen violence um, could thaw. And then the third thing was just like, I was nodding my head furiously there when they're talking about Terence O'Neill and afraid of being bounced by the right wing, hard right wing of his party, and I thought, does that sound familiar? But without further ado, we will go back to one of those who turned their eyes towards politics um, as a means of resolving the conflict, and Atene, you might reflect on John Hume for us. Thanks. Thank you, Durable. So I'd like to uh, thank Eleanor and May very much for the idea for this event to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday and, and the civil rights marches, movements, um, and to thank them for their organisation and all the speakers um, as well who have been so great, and Durable especially. You, Durable and Paul, are very hard acts to follow, so <laughs> but I'll do my best. Um, okay, just check this. So I'm going to talk about John Hume. Uh, Paul has already um, mentioned him, and then move it to the present, to what we learn 
more recently uh, from the Brexit negotiations and in the light of John Hume's legacy. I'll say something very briefly about Bloody Sunday because I think it's important, not just because we are marking it today to remember it, but also it says a lot about how British-Irish relations have actually improved because I think with all the negativity about Brexit, we can, it's, we can still say they are better than they were and we see such change if you compare now to then in terms of government responses and, and policies. I think Paul really has touched on this already and I don't need to repeat it, that it was really mo a movement or movements to achieve civil rights equality and my upbringing would have been to have modelled it very much in my head on the American influence of Martin Luther King, although Paul, I think, highlighted how there are divisions and different perceptions of that and also the slide towards violence that occurred. In terms of Bloody Sunday itself, um, it was one of these marches um, which occurred um, on the 30th of January 1969 in the Bogside area of Derry. Um, in ostensibly or in, genuinely in opposition to internment being introduced that sparked off a huge, um, I suppose, riot and the death of um, 14 victims. And many people probably have seen um, the, the footage that was recorded of that occurring and how shocking it was to see people being killed when they were fleeing and innocent people who, who were peacefully marching. And in terms of consciousness, I think a lot of the, a, fa a big factor in all of this is also the role of the media, which was only just probably becoming more general at that time, making it clear what was happening. Um, and were killed by British soldiers, and that was again so shocking. Eventually, and there was the Widger report, which I can never pronounce it correctly, but in 2010, I think a very historic event, which I think should be noted, was the Savile report and a very historic uh, speech by the then Prime Minister, David Cameron, who I think we all now associate with the Brexit referendum, <laughs> nothing else. It's like Tony Blair, I suppose, in the Iraq war, an analogy, analogy uh, in some ways. Um, but um, he apologised officially for Bloody Sunday, and that was a momentous event. Um, and then, of course, we have the Queen's visit, which some of us were talking about over dinner, that the first time a British monarch visited Ireland occurred then soon after that in 2011. Um, so it was in contrast to the, the approach of British governments that uh, it shows the change that has occurred in British government's policy and approach to Northern Ireland through decades compared to the 60s and 70s, which is why I've mentioned it there, and something I think to remember again in the context of Brexit. As regards John Hume specifically in all this, because Paul has um, spoken really with great insight and, and first-hand knowledge of the civil rights movement, he was known or is regarded as being an innovative nationalist in the Northern Irish context at that time. As Paul said, he was the product of free education and education, and the generation of Northern Irish leaders um, reflected that and became leaders in a very thoughtful, insightful way. And where his innovation was, which seems so obvious to us now in the context of the Good Friday Agreement, but he argued and emphasised that you could both be a nationalist and yet accept Northern Ireland's status as part of the UK as a given. So it was a constitutional form of nationalism that didn't seek sudden, quick or violent change, but saw unification as a gradual process by consent, uh, not to be forced upon any community, and which typified the conflict as, one of, as a conflict of identities, not just territorial, but about identities. So it, he was highly innovative, and that thinking really went back to the 1950s, where, where he begins to... Um, develop those ideas. He also strongly emphasised the need for a democratic party to represent nationalists and saw conflict in Northern Ireland and I suppose more generally as representing a failure of democracy and of legitimacy of democratic institutions. And he also emphasised mutual respect and again gradual change that a united Ireland or any change does not occur through violence in a way and occurs gradually. He was seen as a great parliamentarian in that way, um, he, in respecting the rights of, of a democracy and trying to uphold those rights, and in valuing the role of parliaments and of democratic institutions in advancing political causes. And that was at every level. Um, so the SDLP held its seats in Westminster, 
And in addition, in the European Parliament, he was seen as a very devoted and shrewd negotiator. He used the European institutions to advance his political strategy, and he did that extremely successfully. So as I said, he conceptualized the conflict as a clash of identities, and very gradually what emerged, and again, quite early on, this was in his thought, was the totality of the relationship, which was a term used in the 1980s, between Britain, Ireland, and Northern Ireland, that the conflict was not just internal, because the traditional view of conflicts and of the Northern Irish conflict was very much an internal divide, very much typified as a religious war, as Paul said in the EU, that it was just between religions. Um, but in fact, he, he emphasized it was much broader than that. It was about misrule and it was about <coughs> policy failures, not just from the British government, but also Irish governments he lobbied as well, and that the British-Irish intergovernmental, the internal relationship and the cross-border relationship all had to be dealt with and resolved successfully and institutionalized, which eventually became the Good Friday Agreement, um, that, that framework of three strands and various dimensions to resolving conflict. The EU was central to his approach. Um, he was, I may be obsessed is too strong a word, but maybe Paul could shed light on this, apparently genuinely devoted to the concept of Franco-German cooperation and what the EU had done for that, and thinking that was a model for Northern Ireland, um, and, and really um, wedded to that idea. And I said at an, another TRIS event um, that we had last term, how Mark Durkin, who became leader of the SDLP after him, said that John Hume wanted to really make the EU a bigger part of the Good Friday Agreement, because actually the EU is not mentioned very often in the Good Friday Agreement, and that someone said to him, John, you can't have chips with everything. So it was kind of re reflecting how committed he was to that idea, and I would like to know why he wanted it too. Did he foresee any of these problems? Did he want the EU to be more involved? Um, so culminated then in the Good Friday Agreement. Um, it's very clear from ver various accounts and from, and from even media accounts, UK and Irish membership of the EU was assumed. It was a given in, for the Good Friday Agreement. And as I said, that was central to John Hume's belief system and his thought, and how it also was central to the success of the British-Irish relationship. And again, um, that um, relationship was often, in the context of EU membership, seen as very successful, that the EU had helped it, um, as we've just been saying very briefly, that the UK and the Irish governments often had common interests economically. They could see each other without talking about the sore thumb of partition. They could talk about other issues. They could talk away from their constituencies more privately and informally. So it was seen as a very central element. It also enshrined or at least um, made more visible Irish sovereignty as a state in its own, of its own, with its sovereign powers, paradoxically. And I remember speaking to a British diplomat who had been in the EU from the 70s and said he very quickly saw a change in attitude among British um, diplomats and politicians towards the Irish government with EU membership, where they saw it very clearly as a separate state because that hadn't really become embedded. Um, Obviously, Brexit takes away that framework and has severely damaged it. So in terms of Hume's legacy, Brexit is, it takes away a pillar of his thought and of his framework um, in a way that is really quite shocking. Um, and I think we all feel that over the past few years, what we've seen. So lessons learnt um, from Hume and from Brexit and where we are now to try and bring it together from Hume, we see the power of intensive and long-term lobbying and a political strategy, where he really used every channel available, where he, which I didn't mention, um, courted US senior uh, senators and politicians and got them on board to influence policy, which is depicted in Martha Fitzpatrick's film last year, Hume in America, um, very successfully developing relationships with elite politicians, lobbying and getting their support, which was crucial at various times, which we saw in the Good Friday Agreement, um, the granting of visa, for example, um, to Gerry Adams, different decisions that were made that very much reflected a very close relationship. He influenced the Irish government, Department of Foreign Affairs. His thought permeates really the approach to conflict resolution that we see in the Irish government and eventually the British government culminating in the Good Friday Agreement. The totality of relations, the three strands, the role of the EU, all these things 
are, you know, emanate very much, I mean, it's wrong to be too reductionist, but very much from Hume's approach and became policy through his long-term strategy, his lobbying of the EP as well. The role of the EU as central is a lesson we have learned, and it was successful. It, I'd argue it wasn't a cause of uh, the peace process, but it, was, it oiled the wheels. It made it easier for unionists to cooperate at times and to engage in cross-border cooperation because the money was neutral. It was EU money. It wasn't Irish money. And also, he emphasised strongly through the three strands, but the essential condition of British-Irish cooperation, of governments cooperating and having a strategy which would stand up to veto players. So it's the Sunningdale Agreement, for example, where um, the Sunningdale Agreement's power sharing and the overall agreement collapsed in the face of unionist opposition um, from some unionists, not all. Um, the lesson learned from that was that British and Irish governments needed to have a joint approach, a joint strategy, joined up thinking and stand firm um, in implementing a policy. And it's the culmination of that we see very much in the Good Friday Agreement because that began in the 80s. Lessons about the EU through all this, we see its ability to, within Brexit, to form a coherent voice, even now with 27 states. The peace packages that were granted to Northern Ireland from the 90s at the time, and now if people were to pay attention to them, which probably they don't much, was a very uh, strong example too of that coherence because EU states agreed to divert funds specifically to Northern Ireland. It wasn't part of regional policy, it was a specific standalone package, and they agreed to divert that money at a time when enlargement was happening. So it was a relatively prosperous time, but at the same time enlargement was occurring, there was a need for funds, but they all stood behind this idea. So that coherence has been there a long time, and there was always a, an argument that if the EU got bigger, it would get weaker and it wouldn't have that coherence. That has not happened, even now with all these states. And we see that in the way, following Irish very intense lobbying as well, Irish governmental lobbying, they to this day uh, support the backstop and refuse to re uh, renegotiate the withdrawal agreement, for example, and that that is reflecting Irish preferences, but also they've made clear EU preferences on the importance of maintaining a soft border. We see the ability of the EU to empower small states, such as the Irish government, even though sovereignty is shared and pooled. We see how successful it has lobbied. But we see very clearly the absence of Northern Ireland from the UK's political agenda. And that comes out very uh, clearly in the crisis of Brexit. That was very clear from the referendum time onwards when Northern Ireland wasn't mentioned. And it's really only when the backstop became an issue that that was reversed very much and we see more references to Northern Ireland, more sensitivity to it coming from Theresa May really over the past 18 months. We see also the miscalculations of the UK government in all this because I'm sure many of you would have seen various <coughs> media accounts and, and various commentators um, and conservative politicians, some of them arguing that the EU will cave in on the backstop once the divorce bill is agreed. So once they get their money and their rebate, the backstop won't matter anymore. And that never happened. The backstop has remained a priority and it's over that time, I think my feeling is the British government paid more attention to it. We also possibly, overlooking of the, the whole period, um, can see Irish government miscalculations too. And by that, I suppose specifically, again, something we were talking about at dinner, is that really both governments took their eye off the ball as regards Northern Ireland once the peace process um, was a success, ostensibly, in many ways, of course it was. Um, there was less attention paid to Northern Ireland and less emphasis. So that Brexit really has exposed um, a lot of those weaknesses. So some of the tensions, the rhetoric, the stereotypes we see now, I'd argue really reflect weaknesses which were there already and hadn't been addressed and have now just erupted again. So the problems were never fully gone. And one of the things that on a personal level and a political level would concern me is the ability of stereotypes to resurface so quickly, which again we were talking about at dinner briefly today. Um, so the rhetoric has become very uh, black and white very often about these issues and about each other uh, in this context. On the Irish side, um, depiction of the British uh, position as being imperial or that the Brexit decision was an imperial one, harking back to when Britain was an empire. And then on the Irish side, this sort of depiction in the media of um, you know, Leo Varadkar being this kind of young upstart causing a lot of trouble, and um, that really people are making a great deal of a fuss about the border when it can be dealt with quite sensibly in other ways. So we see those kind of stereotypes which would have been there in the past re-emerging, which I never heard in my lifetime because I would have been a, a teenager really during, well, yeah, 
late old teenager during the, in 1985 and, and things were improving. So I, am not, I was not used to personally hearing some of the rhetoric that I have heard recently and I found that very shocking and very upsetting. So while the picture and depiction of Bloody Sunday, which I mentioned, has gone, and thankfully and hopefully it will never come back, that kind of policy, um, hardline policy towards things, um, and while there's been such a strong and fruitful and rich relationship between Britain and Ireland, I think the reemergence of stereotypes is worrying, and I think it's been managed very carefully by both governments. I think once it began, I, both Theresa May, Leah Radker, Simon Coveney have been very careful I think to, to dampen that. So yes, at the moment there are tensions, but that's been, I think, stated quite diplomatically. Um, we also see the potential, of course, in Northern Ireland for sectarianism and polarization to reignite. So the Brexit issue, because the majority of Catholics voted to stay in the EU, and the overall majority voted to stay, and then um, the majority of unionists voted to leave, but a significant proportion voted to stay as well. But nevertheless, since then, we see a huge polarization in rhetoric and in language, um, which has brought the sectarian divide to the front again. And on top of that, there's no executive, which was not caused by Brexit, but Brexit has, has made things worse. So really, what's happened in the past 20 years um, is a short little snapshot of the total history of Ireland, Northern Ireland, and Britain, and the two islands. And therefore, these things are quite worrying to see them reignite so quickly. It shows that really what we see as embedded is probably not as embedded as we thought, the cooperation we thought was there. But we do see how, as I said, leaders have the ability, political leaders on both, in both governments, to manage these tensions. And to a degree, to a large degree, they have done so successfully. At times not, but in, in general, I would argue, they have managed to dampen down the rhetoric. Individual party political leaders, maybe not, or you know, politicians, MPs and TDs at times, but the leaders of governments, um, of both governments, I would say, have been relatively, well, attempting and have succeeded in, in um, mollifying to an extent the extremes. So conclusion from civil rights to Brexit. Northern Ireland has been compared to an orphan child that no one wanted. Um, both governments really ignored it until the conflict occurred, and were quite happy to pay little attention to it after peace um, and the Good Friday Agreement. The UK's government was initially repressive to the conflict, and the conflict brought Northern Ireland to the centre of world attention. And then we see the blossoming and development of a very strong British-Irish relationship, which I'm not a comparativist, but I would say is very unique, the cultural ties between the islands. The fact that we did grow up with sort of television uh, from the UK, there was a blending culturally, which I think is, is quite unusual. Um, and we've relations, and um, all of us share relations in, in Britain and Ireland. All that intermeshing, um, it's been so hugely positive. Um, however, the, con the Brexit has really brought Northern Ireland back to the centre stage again, brought partition back to the centre stage again, and highlighted, as I said, some memories from the past, not as bad, but created <coughs> some of those stereotypes again. And complacency, um, I would argue, has, has really been a huge problem. I should try and skip through this. Too, I think it's too much, but um, I think overall we see the weaknesses in the relationship that have been highlighted. And overall, back to Hume, the threats to legitimacy by Brexit, where you have a substantial proportion of the Northern Irish population who want to stay in the EU, and you have polarisation, and you have internal politics, the DUP's position as well in Westminster. Um, all of this um, highlights threats to legitimacy, which is dangerous. You know, it's, it's not at the moment an imminent threat, but it's something that should not develop any further. So thank you very much. I do know what it is about Northern Ireland and chips. Uh, John Hume has been told he couldn't have them for anything, and Sammy Wilson is telling us in the event of an OD to go to the chipper. Um, really, really interesting, um, is Hume. What I thought was interesting is that one of the things about the EU is that one of Hume's legacy is that one of the things the Irish government has been accused of is using the EU as a political strategy, but they certainly took the, the ball that uh, John Hume um, started and ran with it. And one of the big things I might maybe even keep to the, the wider discussion is on that issue of miscalculations and kind of the key point we're at, because in the one sense, if, if the DUP or sections of our community push 
the integrity of the union so far. It could actually, contradictory say, in, in another way, kind of lead as a catalyst to a debate for a united Ireland, perhaps that they don't want, in the same way as the Irish government, in its very, very firm position, an understandable position to really stick with the backstop, could, in the event of a no-deal Brexit, actually create the one thing that they didn't do. So it's a really, really interesting um, idea, the notion of calculations. So we're on now to uh, Dahi colleagues. Sometimes when you're reading what people like me and all in the media are doing, it doesn't reflect perhaps what is going on behind the scenes. And uh, Di has an extraordinary career um, in our foreign service. And the one thing that uh, diplomats are always said to have, and I know Sarah is here as well, is that when all else fails, and perhaps when we don't have it, they have to have a duty to hope. So perhaps to give us an idea, Dahi, into the kind of innovative thinking that has got us out of trouble in the past, and maybe we'll do so again, uh, please give him a warm welcome. Thanks. Thank you, Dahi. Um, I just want to say something about the, the reaction of the Irish government to, to what was happening in Northern Ireland uh, from 68, uh, 69 onwards. Uh, and, just, and just to preface what I'm going to say by saying that I largely agree with practically everything of the two previous speakers. Um, from 1922 to 1968, 69, um, both the governments in London and the government in Dublin uh, let the Unionists get on with it in Northern Ireland. Um, neither government interfered. Uh, for the Southern government, uh, and particularly for de Valera, uh, the, the expression of independence from London, of an, a capacity to carry out policy which was different from British policy in London, uh, was all important. And any of you who have read uh, uh, McCullough's second volume of the biography of de Valera, uh, there was a really serious offer uh, by the British government during the Second World War to do something serious on partition, which was turned down by de Valera because I think for him uh, the independence of the 26 counties from London uh, was rather more important than partition. And so for those first 50 years, 60 years of independence from 1922 onwards, Irish governments did practically nothing of any consequence to help uh, the minority community in Northern Ireland who did not have equality in that state. And it was that which caused the civil rights marches more than anything else. It was the demand for equality. Um, when the troubles broke out, the reaction in the Irish government, uh, there was part of the Irish government, as you well know, who were keen on supplying weapons for people in Northern Ireland. And eventually, the Taoiseach Lynch uh, came down on the side of those who wanted uh, peaceful means. When the then Irish government, and particularly Hillary, the foreign minister, uh, tried to raise Northern Ireland matters in Westminster uh, with the British government, uh, he was told that the internal politics of the United Kingdom were not a matter for any foreign government. And this was in a, in a position where what was happening in Northern Ireland had a serious possibility of unsettling uh, our state. That changed pretty quickly. So that by 73, certainly, Heath is prepared to try to advance um, settlement in Northern Ireland. Heath intervenes in Northern Ireland in a way no previous British Prime Minister had done. And he wants to bring in the Irish government and he wants to bring in the political parties in Northern Ireland insofar as he could. And the SDLP and the leadership of the then Unionist Party participated in those talks at Sunningdale in 73, which eventually led to the establishment uh, of a cross-party government in Belfast, comprising the SDLP, the Alliance Party, and the Ulster Unionists. Uh, it made proposals for um, much better cooperation between Belfast and Dublin. Uh, and then it was hoped that the relationship between London and Dublin would improve. And there were contacts of a kind which had never taken place before.
helped very much, I have to say, by the fact that by this stage we were both members of the EEC. Um, it failed. It failed probably because there was a very considerable number of people uh, within the unionist community who just did not wish to share power, who were probably scared by a Council of Ireland. And it also changed as a result of an election in February 1974 when the Labour Party came in. And I really have not read very much about that particular Labour Party, which was in power from 74 until 79, uh, which would give me much confidence in terms of British-Irish relations and in terms of standing up uh, to violence from both sides uh, in Northern Ireland. I served in London from 1977 to 1982 uh, as um, the person dealing with the political parties uh, in Britain and the person dealing with the British press uh, in the embassy. And I can tell you there was no respect, there was no trust. Uh, both governments felt that they were not getting the proper cooperation from the other. Callaghan's government was dependent pretty much not in quite the same way as Mrs. May is dependent on the DUP, but he was dependent on the OUP and particularly on Molino and Enoch Powell, who met one of the junior ministers on a weekly basis to uh, let the British government know of their shopping list. If you'll excuse me a minute. Um, Arnold Batten was murdered. The um, Erie Neve, who was a friend of mine, was murdered. You had the hunger strikes, and then it ended up with the Falklands. And really, the two governments, they were talking beside one another. They were not talking to each other, and there was no trust. The change came about with the election of the coalition government at the end of 1982 and in 1983. And that government uh, composed particularly of Fitzgerald, Barry and uh, Dick Spring. They were determined to do three things. And by the way, throughout this time, a man of huge influence on what the Irish government was doing was John Hume. They were determined to do three things. Firstly, to try and address the problems that the minority community were facing in Northern Ireland, particularly in terms of human rights and particularly in terms of justice and dealings with the police and the UDR and the British Army. And to do that in conjunction with the British government, not by shouting it from the rooftops, but by actually engaging uh, with the British government at both official and um, ministerial level. That's one issue. The second issue was they were determined to try to redefine Irish nationalism, which they did in the New Ireland Forum. And that gave the Irish government a platform on which they could engage with the British government without this constant demand for the British government to force the unionists into a united Ireland and solve partition. Uh, and the third thing was to try to engage with the British. Now by this time, there were many ministers in the Conservative government who were aware that the initial attempt made in Sunningdale had to be revived. That the problems of Northern Ireland, which were intense, could not be resolved by the British government alone, but had to be resolved in conjunction with the Irish government. And there were in particular two very senior British civil servants, without whom the Anglo-Irish Agreement wouldn't have existed. That was the Cabinet Secretary, Lord Armstrong, who's still alive, and uh, Thatcher's Foreign Affairs uh, advisor, who was a Foreign Office man called uh, David Goodall. It took until 
November 1985, three and a half years, to do what the Irish government and increasingly the British government wanted to do and which produced the Anglo-Irish Agreement. Under the terms of the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985, the Irish government was accepted by the British government as being able to raise with the British government matters of concern under a whole range of areas of concern to the nationalist community in Northern Ireland. And through the Anglo-Irish Secretariat in Belfast, of which I was a member, and through the Anglo-Irish Conference, where the Irish Foreign Minister and the Northern Ireland Secretary met pretty much on a monthly basis, they could address the problems of nationalists. And we sought, through contact with people in Northern Ireland, as Paul will remember well, we sought to try to find out what were these grievances, were they legitimate, and if so, we'd raise them with the British government. And we had a very great deal of success. There were two particular problems, or maybe three, if you're looking at it from a British point of view. The first was, just as in 1974, at the time of the Sunningdale Agreement, after the Anglo-Irish Agreement, the provosts upped the game and sought to bring down the Anglo-Irish Agreement in the same way as they had sought to bring down the Anglo-Irish, the, the, uh, the Sunningdale Agreement. And then secondly, the Unionists couldn't believe what happened. The numbers of Unionists who took to the streets, I think it was in December, when they had the big marches on the Saturday, we were in no doubt that there was more than 60% of the male Unionist population on the streets. They resigned their seats in Westminster in protest and I don't think they've ever really had um, the same trust in any British government after the Anglo-Irish Agreement as they had uh, before. The Anglo-Irish Agreement did work and it did work because neither the provosts nor the hardline unionists could bring it down. It was intergovernmental. It didn't involve the local politicians as Sunningdale had. Now that's not necessarily very democratic, but there was no other way of getting it done. The real long-term result of the Anglo-Irish Agreement was that it brought the British and Irish governments together, working together to try to resolve the problems of Northern Ireland for everybody in Northern Ireland. And over the years, we built up very, very good working arrangements uh, between the two governments, between London uh, and Dublin. You got the Downing Street Declaration a few years afterwards. Then you got intense negotiations, which eventually led to the Good Friday Agreement, which was a framework agreement. And then it took about nine or ten years before the Good Friday Agreement really took control, as it were, of practically everything in Northern Ireland when justice and home affairs were devolved uh, to Stormont. Where are we now? Well, I have to say I'm fearful. Firstly, the differences between the two communities in Northern Ireland have not gone away. There are very many people uh, on both sides who know a lot more about the other side now than they did in the past. But there are still huge, huge sectarian ghettos and peace walls over the place. They haven't gone away. And I remember before leaving London the second time in 2007, I remember talking to Gordon Brown before he became Prime Minister and telling him this, that the two governments needed to nurture this thing for at least three generations. Don't forget, it took us three generations here in the South to get over the Civil War. It was going to take the same in Northern Ireland. And it can only be done by the two governments working together because, quite frankly, the politicians in Northern Ireland don't have the capacity to do it on their own. As we've seen, for example, with the collapse of the executive two and a half years ago. I think we're in dangerous times for a number of reasons. I think Brexit has made it worse. 
because it is polarizing the political community even more than it was polarized in the past. It has shifted the power in the unionist community to the unionist politicians in Westminster rather than to the unionist politicians in Stormont, which reminds me of what was happening with Molyneux and Powell in the, in the, uh, in the 1970s. But more importantly than all of that, it has put the two governments on different sides of the table. And that really does worry me. The old stereotypes that you were talking about, you're hearing them again. To listen to people like Boris Johnson or Rhys Mogg talk about the problems of Northern Ireland, it really makes me weep. Given the effort that British politicians put into this peace process, um, I think Brexit's going to happen. I don't think that easy relationship that existed between British and Irish politicians and British and Irish civil servants within the European Union, when we were both within the European Union, and when we had many, many, many common interests and worked together, that's going to disappear. So I think it really is incumbent on the two governments to start thinking about how they're going to manage this British-Irish relationship in the future. There are some things around, like the British-Irish Council, uh, there are some things around, like the British-Irish Secretariat in Belfast or the, the North-South Secretariat in Armagh. I think the two governments really need to look at these institutions, to look at the political relationship and try to ensure that the benefits which the two governments working together brought to Northern Ireland, that they continue into the future, Brexit or no Brexit. So then I'm going to ask each of our um, panellists to come and join me in the stage here just for the Q&A session. I think we'll go um, straight into it. But I might just ask uh, Sarah Tiffany, who is the DCOM, if you have any maybe thoughts or reflections in, uh, in response to, to Dahi. So he says that, um, that he's fearful. Sarah, would you like to? Yeah. Why don't you? You're clear. Yeah, you do it from there. So I have the great excuse that I didn't come prepared to say anything, so you'll have to, um, you'll have to forgive me for making it up on the hoof. But yes, I, I would like to, to respond to a lot of what I've heard, and a bit like what Dottie said at the beginning of his speech, I mean, I agree with the vast majority of everything I've heard from everybody who's spoken this evening. I, I, I do share many of the concerns that have been expressed. I, I come at this from a particularly sort of odd position, which it might be worth just me explaining a second, which is that um, one of the many reasons that I am in Dublin and for the third time is because I'm married to an Irish diplomat from Donegal. So uh, I am a kind of embodiment of the weird people to people complicated links that there are between uh, between our countries. I have I have three children who are the children of an Irish and a British diplomat, and we have some very interesting conversations about Brexit over the dinner table. Um, <laughs> I think some of the things that strike me, not just on, about what's happening now, but, but generally over the kind of 20 years um, and more that, that I've been kind of thinking about this relationship, and it's a bit been touched on by some of the other speakers, is, is that weird disparity in, in knowledge and education and the way that impacts on the way that we, we think about each other. I'm always, I'm always really struck that people in Britain know shamefully little about our history in, in Ireland. I mean, in some ways, I suppose it's understandable in that we have an awful lot of history and not all of it was looking this way. And if you are in Ireland, a lot of your history as a country is shaped by the relationship with, with us. So there is a disparity. I think people here tend to know vastly more about the history of the relationship between our countries than people in Britain do. I think that became almost a, a positive, actually, for a while, in that it was really easy for people in Britain to forget about all the complexities. Uh, I mean, I'm sort of the similar similar generation to Itain, and um, I, I, I'm absolutely amazed to hear Dahi saying that he can remember people saying the moment when it dawned on British diplomats that Ireland was a separate state. I mean, it had moved on from that by the time I was... Um, 
working in in the foreign office that's that's genuinely shocking for, for me to hear um, and uh, I think Ireland has the most uh, is possibly the most powerful PR machine in the entire world I think not entirely sure how Ireland manages the trick of pulling off having absolutely everybody in the world think that Ireland is the most fantastic country. It is, obviously, but you know, managing to project that to everyone is, is quite remarkable. And you do it really effectively in Britain as well, and I think the general perception in, in Britain um, amongst the vast majority of people, certainly sort of under the age of 60, is, is absolutely the image that Ireland tries to project to the whole world. I mean, people know that Ireland is brilliant and everybody's great fun and it's a constant party and Irish people are absolutely lovely and why wouldn't, why wouldn't you love Ireland? And that is genuinely, I think, the way people felt about the country and that was, that was very positive, um, which is why it's so shocking and, and so difficult, I think, to cope with this sort of muscle memory that some of the other speakers have, have referred to. Uh, and I'm almost more shocked the way it comes out in, in Britain than I am that it comes out in, in Ireland. In some ways, perhaps I'm less surprised that some of that muscle memory that we'd all thought was, was gone. 20 years is a short time since the Good Friday Agreement, and maybe we shouldn't have been surprised that, that some of that muscle memory was closer to the surface than, than we thought. As, as Dahi said, you know, three generations possibly was, was an optimistic estimate. Um, I think... Um, I think these are, I mean, I'm sort of skating around Brexit a bit because it's what we've been doing all evening and thinking about the British-Irish relationship. Um, there have been two moments in my career when I felt like I'm watching history happening in front of my eyes. And one was genuinely the, the state visit, the visit by, by the Queen. I, I know it feels as if, um, as if you know, it's just, just Liz Windsor came over and was nice to everybody. And in a way, that was how Ireland sort of loved it so much because it sort of related, people here sort of related to her almost on a personal level. But it genuinely felt like history was forming in front of our eyes in a really positive way. I think, I think history is forming in front of our eyes at the moment um, and not in such a positive way. And it is definitely a, a huge challenge. I mean, I've never experienced anything like this in my career. I don't think... I don't think it's happened in most people's lifetimes that we've been in quite this, this, this challenging a situation. And the tragedy is that the the focus of the ch of, of it all at the moment is on is on this particular relationship. But a word that kept coming up all the way through those presentations was trust. In all sorts of different contexts, people talked about trust. And I think I, I think that's what gives me hope. Well, you gave me the challenge of you know diplomats always have to be have to be hopeful. I mean, the world will keep turning. We'll look back on this. Historians are going to have an absolute field day picking this apart and coming up with all the different explanations of of what happened and how everybody did everything wrong. But I think um, I think trust trust is um, is vital as you're trying to navigate choppy waters. And when Dahi talks about how the relationship used to be between our countries, it really has moved on from that. And yes, there are challenges, but that trust is there. I mean, our ministers, I mean, admittedly, it's easier now because you can just send each other a text, but our ministers do know each other and they talk to each other all the time and they pick up the phone to each other. Our civil servants talk all the time. And I know the EU has facilitated that, but it's built a habit of cooperation between us that we have to really invest in working out how we're going to preserve it. But it's such a strong foundation. I mean, I do sometimes say, as a British diplomat here, um, I will take personal pity if that's the best that's on offer. But my goodness, you do get a lot of a sort of personal warmth and, and sympathy from, from people here. There is a, there's a liking, I think, underneath everything, under, underneath all the, the challenges. Um, and that's what, gives me, that's what gives me hope. Dahi sort of threw out a challenge, and it's one that we're very aware of. I mean, I, the embassy works all the time on Brexit. It works all the time on Northern Ireland. You couldn't make it up the way it all comes together. But the other enormous strand of our work is about how do we build that relationship for the future and how do we need to build that relationship differently in a world where we're going to be outside the EU and that's partly about building new structures but it's also it's also about maintaining and building on that trust and using that trust to get us through these these challenging moments um, and using those personal relationships that we that we keep building with each other because in the end we get each other, I think, British and Irish people on the whole. We probably get each other more than we get most other people. In some ways, we're very similar. In other ways, we're very different. The longer I live here, the more I am immensely conscious that I am living in a foreign country. Um, but, 
But we do, and we laugh at the same jokes, and I kind of cling to that as well, as the thought that that is a very strong foundation for a, for a good relationship. So I do have hope, because, you know, the world's not going to stop turning. Frankly, if the world does stop turning, we've got nothing to worry about, because we're not going to be here. Uh, and on the assumption that it does keep turning, we will get past this, and we'll look back on it and unpick it, and I don't imagine that anybody's going to look back on it as the best of moments in our relationship, but I think we will be looking back on it from a much better place than we are at the moment and there is a lot of work and effort going in to making sure that we preserve everything that is good between our countries and there's an awful lot of it. So, thank you. So I, I want to move, I'll just grab a chair for you there, um, just maybe move to move on, I hope there are lots of questions. One that I had um, in my mind, um, perhaps not in 60 days, but I wonder um, if you were still active politically, what would John Hume do at this time? And what would he say maybe just to, to do that? But it's just something I suppose that we invoke him a, a lot in the time. But it might move on. If there are any questions, maybe if you put up your hand, let us know who you are and who you want to direct it to anyone specific on the panel or more generally. So um, uh, does anyone want to kick start us off? Yes, gentleman at the back. Thanks. Just for the whole panel, just a quick question. Do you think this is going to trigger more and Regards to uh, uh, 32 counties, or would the minister scenario be maybe few, in a few years that there could actually be a creation of a 29 county republic Ooh. with uh, a kind of an enclave of the unionists in three counties? So, what I'm saying is, it might be 32 counties, but maybe 29. Oh, there we go. So the question just in relation to the border poll, it's interesting that on that, and I think what a lot of the polling shows is that there isn't much appetite for it now, but in the event of a, a no deal or a hard Brexit, it would increase. I think a significant amount of the population in Northern Ireland believe it will happen within, I think, five to seven years' time. But just maybe on that, the, the, the concept of, um, of a border poll, which obviously Sinn Féin has been sort of perhaps using as a measure of antagonism, and then a new thought in Irish history, a 29-county uh, republic... <laughs> Who would like to take that answer? <laughs> Paul. Um, the 2920 Republic isn't that new, actually. In 1914, there was a notion that, uh, that the east of Ulster would link up with Scotland. Uh, that was just one of the things put forward. But on the broader question, I consider this to be very dangerous, just as I consider referendums which offer very simplistic answers, yes or no, very, very dangerous. And I think that's where we got with Brexit. And I remember many years ago participating in a seminar at the JFK Library in Boston. And one of the speakers was the then deputy leader of Elsie Union's party, uh, Harold McCusker. And an Irish American got up to him and said, look at the demographics. In 20 years time, there's going to be a majority in Northern Ireland we come from the Catholic and Nationalist background. Once that happens, will you accept the majoritarian view? And his response was immediately said, no. He said, the minority have never accepted us as a majority. Why should we accept them as a majority? I think the beauty of the anglo agreement in 1985 and of Good Friday in 1998 was it moved away from that majoritarian mm. ethos. And it's that majoritarian mindset now which I think is poisoning relations in this island. So I certainly would not be in favour, certainly have a discussion, but I think it's very, very dangerous to even begin to consider that there may be a majority, could be 50% uh, plus one, therefore it must go through. It just doesn't work like that. Di, can I be able to speak to that because, you know, um we're now in t talk about commemorations. We'll be seen be commemorating um, the, I suppose, the birth of the state of Northern Ireland, which was created in many respects to protect a majority. And by 2021, that centenary, we're going to see demographic shifts, and over time, that will change in Northern Ireland. And how do you kind of just feel, you know, about that and, and that whole concept of the border poll? For myself, I think it is quite. A dangerous thing to be proposing at this time, but I, I think we had hoped to just assume that it would be something that would emerge gradually, um, and yet Brexit seems to be throwing up those divides again. I, I agree, I think it's very dangerous, uh, and I think it's deeply unsettling for the unionist community, uh, who are, have an equal entitlement to anybody else on this island. Um, 
<coughs> the, the key of the Anglo-Irish Agreement, which to some extent disappeared with the Good Friday Agreement, was the ability of the Irish government to raise issues of consequence for the minority community in Northern Ireland. And under the terms of that agreement, the British government were under treaty obligations to find solutions. The British government didn't control what we raised. We controlled what we raised. And it was largely on the basis of what people in Northern Ireland were raising with us. Now, I'm not claiming, claiming uh, this notion, but a colleague of mine, Michael Lillis, had a letter in the Financial Times about six, eight, maybe ten weeks ago, in which he said that were there ever to be a move towards an, a united Ireland or a federated Ireland, we should start thinking of giving the British government the same rights for the unionist community in any changed scenario. Um, but I do feel, and, and I think Paul would know this much better than I would perhaps attain to, I do feel that the, the feeling in Northern Ireland, the mood in Northern Ireland at the moment, uh, is very tricky. Um, I'm not saying that anybody's going back to war, and I don't think anybody's ever going to go back, or hopefully never going to go back to war, of the stuff that we saw 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, but there are people on both sides. We saw it in Jerry a couple, a, couple, a, a couple of weeks ago, and they're on the, on the loyal side as well. There are people who could make mayhem, and we have to try and make mm -hmm. sure that we avoid that. There's been a polarization in Northern Ireland in the last three, four years, which is very unhelpful. Absolutely. Um, is there another question there? Um, yeah, I'll take this gentleman. I might actually take the two questions together to make the best use of our panel time. Actually, I'm going to take three questions, and after that, I would like to see some ladies' hands uh, up if you can. So look, very quickly, one, two, and three questions rather than submissions so that we can get, get the best of our time. But gentlemen's here. Yeah, uh, Roland Tynan. Um, first, uh, tonight I must say I'm glad I came because there was one particularly uh, perceptive comment which came from Daniel Kelly, which uh, is that... Uh, you know, the peace process was not in good stead before Brexit. You know, as you rightly said, and I, it's the first chance I've had to congratulate you publicly now on your contribution to that process. I think civil servants sometimes are like forgotten people, but your role truly was outstanding in your historical knowledge. I must say, I found tonight particularly valuable and really useful. Uh, but really, the question I want to ask is, we have a crisis in the peace process anyway. The fact is the executive had fallen. Uh, just the week before last, I was in Belfast, and I was quite shocked to see uh, the peace, one of the peace walls near Victoria Hospital. And to think that 9 o'clock at night, a gate is put across, is locked on this main road, and people on the national side are only about a minute from Victoria, Royal Victoria Hospital. But of course, on the other side, if you have a heart attack, you virtually have to go halfway around Belfast. So your chance of dying because of the peace war is actually quite high if you have a heart attack. Now, given that we are so many years since the Good Friday Agreement, we have a problem anyway. And what I want to put to the panelists, uh, and certainly as somebody who was based in London during the time of the referendum, was a very enthusiastic campaigner, and it drove me mad every time I challenged, especially leading Tories about uh, the problem with the border, including grailing, which I did once, and how warmly I was received with that question, reassured this was not going to be a problem, underlining the lack of interest, the lack of knowledge, the lack of any commitment to research about Northern Ireland. But I want to put it to the panel. Isn't it time now that our government, I mean, we as a community, we must confront the problem in the peace process, we must actually make this public. This, there is a real problem, and I get the impression there's far too much complacency. The executive has fallen, as we know, the level of polarization on the ground in Northern Ireland, obviously in poor areas, is still a huge problem. And what amazed me on my recent visit, though I do go to Northern Ireland regularly, is how serious this issue is. And Brexit, as Dolly has eloquently made the point, has aggravated it much more fully. And I think there's a little bit of naivety on the part of our distinguished uh, British diplomat that I, this easy relationship Dolly mentioned between diplomats and the two countries, that cannot continue in this new scenario because 
Seamless borders make life easy for everyone for trade and politics, but it's all going to change after Brexit. Thank, Thank you. you. Could, could have invited you as our fifth panellist. Two more questions. Um, where was it? There was a gentleman at the back here in the blue jumper and the, the gentleman in the red T-shirt. Very good. Obviously, something that was referenced earlier, the, um, the strategic importance in the past of the US role, perhaps not as um, to the fore now. And with this gentleman here in the back. Uh, Tom, and if we were going to play around with county numbers, that's about 65 county uh, Celtic Republic or Federation. <laughs> uh, that would include Ireland, North, South and Scotland. Uh, that would be a member of the European Union and would have sufficient number of Protestants that perhaps make the unions in Northern Ireland feel a bit more safe. There is a question. Well, I'm going to put just the, just that one on kind of the uh, there was a problem anyway in the peace process. The, the, this ongoing question of uh, the U.S. involvement. You know, we were kind of complaining there wasn't a special envoy. Or ha has that dropped uh, in any way, significant way? And then a third one, really. Um, I, it's a bit of a John Humphreys question. Why don't you just uh, let it go and join in? That's uh, where we get Scotland and uh, to join us in some big Celtic alliance. But um, it's really maybe just on that. Um, the peace process was struggling anyway. Wasn't it? Yes, to a degree. I mean, I think Paul will, I'm sure, have more to say about this, but I, I think it's, it's been a success. I mean, there have been naysayers about the Good Friday Agreement all along from the beginning. And really, even before Brexit, there were a number of academics and, I'm sure, citizens arguing that, oh, we have the peace walls and we don't have societal integration. But I think overall, most people who live in Northern Ireland would see it as a huge success. I remember talking to Arthur Ahi, who was a colleague of Paul Arthur's, who was saying that you know his daughter could go out at night and not have to come back by 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock, that there was freedom to move around and feel safe and you didn't worry about your children being out in the evening. So it has been a huge success. The peace process is a success. These are all threats. I think it hasn't been perfect, and I think that's what Dahi was pointing to as well about complacency. It wasn't finished, um, it's a process, um, so it's a huge success, but in terms of embedding the piece, in terms of getting to this uh, generational change over decades, we haven't got there yet. And I, th I think that's borne out, I think, um, Paul and others, just about, you know, it's often said in Northern Ireland that we've achieved a negative form of peace characterised by an absence of violence, but we haven't yet migrated to a positive form of peace where we're truly integrated, so more than 9 out of 10 school children in my native Northern Ireland are still educated in segregated schools. You look at social housing in Northern Ireland, and there are, in fact, as I understand, more peace walls um, now than there were. So there are clearly huge challenges. And I suppose, Dahi, then, Brexit has really... You know, John Hume did favour long-term, gradual change by mutual respect, and Brexit, I suppose, maybe in the kindest uh, terms, has been incredibly unfortunate for that task. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes it, it makes, well, firstly, if you look at the support for Sinn Féin and the support for the DUP, it has increased over the last three, four years. Um, but this was happening before Brexit. Mm -hmm. the, the, the breakup of the executive, three days break. Um, I was talking recently to some retired but very, very senior uh, DUP people a few weeks ago and, <coughs> who are not in favour of what's happening. They're Brexiteers, yes, but they're not in favour of the way that the community is breaking up. And their view is that there is no possibility whatsoever of a devolved government until this Brexit issue is made clear. In the meantime, in the absence of this devolved government, in the absence of politicians working together, as Paisley and Martin McGuinness did, or as Peter Robinson did uh, with Martin McGuinness, when there were problems, they resolved them and they sorted them out. Whereas now, they're shouting from the rooftops about another referendum, and it's not helpful. Um, I don't think really that um, the emphasis will go back into Belfast, where it should be, until perhaps uh, there's a change in the governmental structure in London, which would lead to a situation where the British government is not dependent on the support of one particular party. I suppose, Sarah, that's something that's been 
quite unfortunate. Like, so the big theme in the presentations was about how it needed the joint cooperation of both governments over and above everything else. And yet one of the criticisms or complaints is that, well, look, the British government can't really play its role, its rightful role as a neutral um, guardian of the Good Friday Agreement because it is in fact being propped up and supported by one party within Northern Ireland. Does that parliamentary mix or the numbers game make it more difficult to really get that joint cooperation in circumstances where the strategic interests are, are very marked at the moment? I don't think it necessarily makes a difference in the relationship between the two governments in London and Dublin. What it makes impossible for a member of the SDLP or a member of an alliance party or even more so, uh, a Sinn Féin member, to think that they're going to get the same respect from the British government as the DUP are. It's inevitable. It's, it's politics. I, there's one reason why I'm asked to MC events, and it's not um, out of quality, it's because I'm ruthless about timing. Um, so I'm going to bring events to a close, and I won't close up with anything um, really more than, than what has been said. I think um, what I would like to close with is um, is some thoughts from Duncan Morrow, actually, a, a professor in Ulster who articulates things better than mine. Um, in one sense, I never thought I would be here tonight. I kind of thought I would be marking the 50th anniversary of the commemorations um, of the civil rights marches in a much, much different way. Um, I am subdued and fearful, and I agree with Duncan Morrow when he says that Northern Ireland, in its present guise, could not survive two things. One is a hard Brexit, and one is United Ireland. I suppose what worries me is uh, the time, the limited time that we have. I suppose my appeal to you, uh, just by way of final things, is that um, it's, it's your generation and younger generations here perhaps are going to have to step up now to, 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 really, to, to really make those calls, to reach across the lines. As I say, had I said 15 years ago that it was an Irish-British person or actively Irish and passively British, could have met a, 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 a difficult time doing that. And that is, I think, the opportunity for you, and it's great to see you all out in such numbers, to know that people still do care um, about our little part of the world, our little orphaned world, but as orphans go, would make great siblings. <laughs> so keep us in mind to Paul, to T, and to Sarah, to um, Dahi, and indeed to Roland Tyne, and thank you so, so much. Um, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.